Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's Storage X seminar. Uh, it's been uh, a month and a half since our last seminar. I hope uh, those of you in the Northern Hemisphere uh, is enjoying your summer. Uh, it is really a great pleasure uh, for me and Professor Itwe, the director of the Precourt Institute, um, to host today's seminar. We have a very exciting topic and two excellent speakers to talk about thermal storage. This is a topic that we have covered quite a few times uh, in past seminars for, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, we had the pleasure of hearing from two of our Stanford colleagues and Nobel laureates, uh, Steve Chu and Bob Laughlin, who spoke about thermal energy storage and conversion at some detail. And this is a very important topic for not only conventional, but also for advanced thermal storage. And today's talk is really going to touch on the second aspect of novel storage mechanisms involving heat. And this is not only important for energy storage, but also important for industrial decarbonization as well. And to get us started on this topic, uh, let me introduce our two speakers briefly. Um, we have York Petrosh, who is uh, currently the co who is the co-founder and CTO of Redox Blocks, a company that is developing high temperature uh, thermal storage uh, technology. Um, and we also have Professor Ashingen Henry uh, from um, MIT, who has been working on high energy, high temperature energy storage uh, for about a decade and a half. So York will be our first speaker. So let me ask York to come to this stage. I will. I will keep the, the video off since my internet connection is not that great. Okay, no problem. Well, your, do you want to just you know flash your image so we know what you look like? And then you can turn off. Okay, there's York, so now you know what he looks like. Um, <laughs> York uh, has been working in the area of high temperature thermal chemistry and storage um, for more than 25 years, uh, starting with his uh, PhD work at ETH Zurich. And uh, he's currently uh, the uh, professor of mechanical engineering at Michigan State University. He's on leave uh, to start Redox Blocks, um, and which started just this past year to commercialize uh, thermal energy storage systems. And York will be introducing to us his company. Uh, I believe this is one of the first times uh, in which Redox Blocks is talking about the technology. We're really Please to have your work share with us all the details. And York, we're really excited and looking forward to hearing more. Thank you very much, Will. So I will talk about um, the Redox Blocks technology, uh, which is a thermal chemical storage technology. So we're adding uh, a chemical component to, to this. Uh, it operates at very high temperatures. Uh, and I'll talk both on our applications for industrial heat as well as for grid scale uh, energy storage. Uh, next slide, please. So um, my talk, uh, I'll start with a brief introduction on thermochemical storage, bio redox thermochemical systems, and then introduce our uh, technology concepts, both for high temperature industrial heat uh, and then for uh, really large scale uh, grid integration. I will then uh, spend some time on the um, sort of our secret sauce, the material at the heart of our technology, which is a magnesium manganese oxide. Um, and I will talk a little bit about its uh, cyclical uh, thermochemical stability, the chemical thermodynamics. Uh, this is work that um, uh, we've done in our lab at Michigan State. Uh, with uh, one of my PhD students, Alessandro Bo. I think he's all actually in attendance today. Um, I will probably, for time's sake, skip over uh, the heat transfer aspects uh, and then uh, give an overview on uh, what we have been doing on prototyping. Uh, we have uh, built and tested uh, and now disassembled uh, 100 watt hour system. We're currently running a 10 kilowatt hour system and we're currently constructing a 100 kilowatt hour system and developing uh, some bigger systems uh, uh, which I'll briefly touch upon in the outlay. Uh, next slide please. 
So um, in very simple terms, uh, redox thermochemical uh, storage is, is something like reversible combustion, right? So uh, what we're doing with our technology is we're taking um, something that, you know, that, that may sound uh, from a thermodynamic perspective, um, uh, not very beneficial at first. We take uh, cheap renewable electricity uh, and convert it uh, to high temperature heat to drive uh, a thermal chemical reduction. Uh, and we're doing this with a material. It's a mixed oxide uh, consisting of uh, magnesium manganese oxide. Uh, and if you heat it above temperatures around 13, 1350 degrees C, uh, it will start uh, reducing just thermally, uh, releasing oxygen. We uh, remove, uh, we, we pull, basically pull out the oxygen out of uh, the system um, and then uh, keep uh, the material at that high temperatures uh, um, in an insulated vessel. Uh, and it just sits there until the, the energy is needed. And we get the energy back by passing air, regular air uh, over a pack bed of the material. Uh, the oxygen in the air uh, reacts with the system. Uh, the reaction that we, we, the reduction reaction that we just drove uh, is reversed. We have an oxidation. Um, and uh, the air uh, is in direct contact with the backpack bed, uh, gets heated up to, you know, temperatures between uh, 13 and 1500 degrees C. Uh, and then we can use uh, that high temperature air that leaves the system either uh, directly uh, in, in a range of high temperature uh, industrial applications uh, or to drive uh, a turbo generator. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, I'll explain uh, the uh, industrial heat application first. Uh, this is sort of the, the simpler application. And, and the reason I, I, I took a leave is to, uh, uh, to set up uh, uh, an office here uh, in Europe, where currently, as you all uh, are aware of, uh, there, there is uh, a severe natural gas shortage. And uh, our technology is basically a drop-in replacement uh, for uh, a wide range of natural gas-fired uh, industrial processes. So in this case, uh, as you can see, we have a, a, an internally insulated vessel. Um, it doesn't have to be a pressure vessel. It just has to be airtight. Um, and during the reduction reaction, what happens is uh, the 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 uh, rotary air pump at the bottom left or sort of bottom middle uh, is is uh, insulated from the system with a valve, and uh, the system is heated uh, by passing an electrical current through the pack bed. Uh, magnesium manganese oxide is a semiconductor, so it becomes electrically somewhat conductive at temperatures uh, above approximately 800 degrees C. Um, and then uh, oxygen evolves as the, as the system heats up and the oxygen is removed with a simple industrial uh, blower. Now, once the, we want the heat back, um, air is pumped through the system, through the peck bed uh, with the, uh, the blower or, or air pump um, and uh, it, the oxygen reacts with the uh, magnesium manganese oxide bed. Uh, not, not all the oxygen is used up, it, de depending on the state of charge, uh, between 50% between and around towards the end, around 25% uh, uh, of the uh, oxygen in the air is removed from the air. And so we have uh, somewhat oxygen depleted air uh, that leaves the system at high temperatures, typically between 1300 and 1500 degrees C. Um, and uh, that can be used in a range of uh, industrial processes, uh, ranging from simple things like, uh, like high pressure, high temperature steam generation uh, to a range of um, metal smeltering applications and so on. Um, why uh, would we want to do this? Um, I have not gone into uh, the importance of, of storage, but 
uh, I assume that for uh, the current audience, uh, it is obvious that, of course, you could build a high temperature air heater and just run it. However, if we want to transition to a, uh, a renewable uh, energy system, we have some somehow we have to buffer uh, the the production or generation of electricity relative to uh, when it is used. And in industrial applications, uh, we typically see that the load is relatively constant over either uh, eighteen or twenty four hours, depending on whether uh, whether uh, a given installation runs in two or three shifts. But it is a typically a very constant load, as opposed to renewable generation, which in in uh, specific, especially for uh, in in sun rich areas, is is pretty much centered around noon uh, plus minus three hours. So we have about three hours of production, and um, with a system like this, uh, we we would charge it during. Uh, those six hours, typically you would run at least two systems in parallel, um, charge them uh, rapidly, which is uh, especially simple with this system because a lot of the heat transfer limitations that uh, typically um, are associated with, with PEC beds uh, of particularly in, in, in uh, sensible heat applications, um, we don't have that kind of limitations because Basically, what we're doing is we're dual heating the whole system, so it's like one big resistor. Uh, and and uh, due to the fact that there's simply a volumetric source, uh, there there is literally no heat transfer limitation. Next slide, please. Um, this is our uh, somewhat longer range uh, vision of, uh, and and that is how we started developing this technology. This was was our our first idea. Um, where we would basically take a pressure vessel, insulate it internally, fill it with a PEC bed of magnesium manganese oxide, uh, heat it just as uh, in, in the system that we showed before. But now it goes in place of the combustor uh, of a uh, gas uh, turbine system. And you know, here I'm only showing the a simple uh, turbine system, but, but of course this is apl applicable to um, combine cycles as well. So uh, in, in an ideal case where we're running on a very efficient uh, combined cycle, the store, uh, combined cycle, the storage efficiency is about 55%. Otherwise, the basic idea is very much the same as I showed before during times of um, high electricity generation from renewables, we charge the system, we remove the oxygen, um, that oxygen it can be used as uh, a secondary uh, uh, source of revenue. Um, it's not what we're what we we're focusing on at the moment, but we're generating a significant amount of oxygen um, uh, during that reduction step. And then uh, during during oxidation, uh, the the oxygen is taken out of the air and and, and put back into the storage material. Uh, next slide, please. I now want to hone in a little bit and give a little more detail on the uh, magnesium manganese oxide redox system. Next slide, please. So um, this is a material that uh, was originally developed at the University of Florida by uh, my long-term collaborator, James Klausner. And his group, uh, James and I, uh, have been working on redox systems together for, I think we met 15 years ago. So we've, we've been collaborating on and off. Uh, and this was developed at uh, University of Florida uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, the material is, uh, the, the, the raw materials are very cheap and abundant, uh, sort of at the large scale, about $600 per ton processed cost. Uh, magnesium uh, is the seventh and manganese is the 12th most abundant element in the earth crust. Um, the performance uh, is outstanding. We have an energy density of around 2400 megajoule per cubic meter. 
Um, this is combining sensible heat storage between 1,000 and 1,500 degrees C and uh, the chemical aspect, so enthalpy of reaction. It's about two-thirds chemical and one-third um, uh, sensible heat. And this is about three times the energy density of molten salt, just for, for, for reference and comparison. Uh, temperature uh, operation is between 1,000 and 1,500 degrees C. However, the, most of the reaction, approximately 80%, per, uh, proceed between in the range between 1,300 and uh, 1,450 degrees C. Uh, so the, the actual temperature uh, range that we're, we're running most of the time uh, is, is somewhat more narrow, which is beneficial, especially uh, if you want to run on, on gas turbines. Um, this is equivalent to kernel efficiencies between uh, 77 and 83%. Uh, the material is uh, very robust. Uh, we have shown, shown uh, over 100 cycles in actual prototypes, uh, uh, 2,500 hours uh, and counting. Uh, we did not observe uh, loss in capacity in the sense that, that the changes that we see are within the measurement errors of our devices. Uh, the materials are safe. Uh, they're non-toxic, non-corrosive, uh, non-combustible, uh, except for uh, the fact that they oxidize at high temperatures. Um, and uh, the material is 100% is recyclable. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, patents both on the material as well as on the application. Next slide, please. please. Um, so now let's dive, dive into uh, some of the chemical properties of the material. Next slide, please. So um, the material, what has been holding back redox cycling or redox thermochemical storage is cyclical thermochemical stability. Uh, most of those materials are um, geared towards high temperature operations, and 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 that is beneficial from a from an efficiency point of view, of course. Uh, however, they also tend to sinter. So what you typically see in 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 a lot of metal oxide uh, redox systems is that the first couple of cycles uh, are wonderful, high energy density, very repeatable for five, six, seven cycles uh, where everything is, is still in the powder form. Uh, and then uh, slowly, slowly uh, the capacity decays. And after 50 cycles, not a lot of your initial uh, ability to exchange oxygen is left. And um, the, the amazing properties of uh, this mixed oxide is that it maintains its porosity uh, and more specifically its specific surface area um, through cycling. So what you see in the bottom uh, left is a uh, CT micro uh, computer tomography image of a uh, pressed pellet. And then uh, on the right hand side, the same pellet after 50 cycles. And you can actually see that um, a pore structure evolves um, the, the, the envelope stays uh, relatively uh, the same, uh, but the internal pore structure evolves. And, and uh, you can see that a large surface area is maintained. And this is beneficial for oxygen exchange, uh, which is key to the performance. Uh, what you see in the graph on the bottom right is uh, thermochemical cycling uh, data in a TGA, in a thermogrammetic uh, analyzer. Um, and you see a uh, at the bottom you see a, an, an almost perfectly overlapping uh, red and blue curves uh, that show the mass change, the relative mass change. Uh, so it's, it's approximately five percent uh, mass change due to the oxygen uptake and release during oxidation and reduction. So we're cycling between a thousand and fifteen hundred degrees C uh, and uh, releasing and taking up oxygen. Uh, the red curve is uh, in 50 initial cycles, and then you see the blue curve. Um, that is the same pellet after uh, a 500-hour dwell at 1500 degrees C. 
uh, you can actually see that initially uh, performance is, is slightly better and then it converges back to, to sort of the converged state. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So um, what is fascinating about the material from a, from a more fundamental point of view is how this pore structure evolved. What you see evolves, what you see here is um, uh, SEM images of a, um, a pellet that uh, spent a couple thousand hours inside a prototype reactor. And you see that it forms a very open pore, reticulous porous ceramic uh, um, a foam structure, and um, this is what we think is behind uh, the excellent cyclability. Next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, a little closer up, a, a microcomputer tomography image of a cross, cross section of a fresh cycle. Next, uh, sorry, fresh pellet. Next slide. This is then after 20 cycles, you see there is some, some, um, some sintering happening, some compaction, but then after 70 cycles, next slide, um, you see this sort of almost radial structure uh, due to oxygen exchange and you have a nice open pore structure. Uh, and then we let it dwell for a while, next slide. And you can see that uh, you see some sintering. However, if you restart the cycling, you'll go back to a structure that's uh, much closer to the previous slide. Next slide, please. Um, this is just uh, to illustrate that the actual composition, the relative uh, magnesium to manganese uh, ratio affect uh, whether the, the, uh, the material shrinks overall, like in its envelope, uh, or uh, stays, con uh, stays, uh, uh, stays the same in its envelope density. And this is something uh, we're, we're still working on to get, uh, to, to get the exact formulation for, for uh, as stable envelope uh, volumes as possible. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So what you see here is the um, chemical equilibrium composition. So um, this is sort of a, the, the chemical equation is, is almost a cartoon uh, of, the, of, the actual, um, of the actual reaction. Uh, and uh, Y signi uh, signifies the excess oxygen uh, as opposed to the, to the monoxide in, in um, uh, in the oxidized state. And what you see in the graph at the bottom left is the temperature and oxygen particle pressure dependent uh, value of Y. And what you can see is that high, at high temperatures and low oxygen pre particle pressures, um, the, you're almost uh, at the monoxide. Uh, and then uh, as you go to lower temperatures and higher partial pressures, uh, you're adding more and more uh, oxygen to the equilibrium. Next slide, please. Uh, we've built a couple of prototypes. Next slide, please. So the very first one, uh, and of course, by prototype, I mean a system that is relatively close to um, an, uh, a potential product or application in the sense of uh, it doesn't, uh, rec it runs on regular compressed air. Uh, it's inside a pressure vessel. So our 100 a watt hour prototype uh, that we built about, I think we started constructing that about two and a half years ago or so. That's the smaller vessel that you see in the, in the background, in the middle. Um, so uh, it's basically an internally insulated system that has uh, about 200 milliliters of the material uh, or a little less than that uh, at its center. Uh, we cycled this system. This was the, the very first trial. Uh, between 0.2 and 11 bar absolute uh, in the temperature range between 20 and 1500 degrees C. The actual cycling proceeded uh, at between 1000 and 1500 degrees C. Power is about a kilowatt. Most of that power goes actually to keeping the temperature. So this is, this is not really a storage device. It's, it's just a, a device to cycle the material in the peck bed. Uh, next slide, please. So this was sort of the first proof of concept where we, uh, where we uh, did five cycles, uh, reaching 
the 2500 uh, megajoules per cubic meter as as predicted uh, in five cycles in a real life situation with using actual compressed air, uh, no bottled gases, um, a, a real vacuum pump to suck out the oxygen during during reduction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then we went to, and this is the, the the vessel you saw in the foreground in the in the previous picture. Uh, this is our 10 kilowatt hour prototype, very similar, sim actually the same uh, same test stand. Um, uh, just a little more uh, more elaborate. Next slide, please. And here we've been cycling this uh, for uh, 1,800 1, hours. Um, uh, approximately, we currently have have a downtime uh, uh, because we some experienced some some issues with with the heating system. Um, what's interesting is that initially we, we were a little worried because we saw this this uh, this decay uh, of uh, energy uh, stored. Um, this turns out to be an artifact of uh, drift in the uh, measurement of the of the uh, in the flow meters in the measurement of the airflow to the system. So as we re after C sixty five, so sort of towards the right of the graph. We replaced uh, we replaced uh, uh, one of the one of the flow meters, uh, and we're pretty much back to uh, the original uh, energy uh, dens density. Next slide, please. So currently, we're building a hundred kilowatt hour uh, system. It's under construction, uh, and we're planning to uh, have that operational uh, this fall. Uh, basically, scaling up the system. To a level where the 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 losses relative to to the power input uh, become much smaller on the order of uh, ten to twenty percent over uh, over half a day or so of storage. Uh, so now this is going to be the first real storage device that that, that we're going to build, and the diameter is about a meter, uh, uh, height is almost two meters. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we have an ongoing uh, project uh, with uh, uh, with uh, collaborating with Siemens Energy uh, and Martin Energy, uh, funded by RPE, uh, where we're uh, getting this technology towards a first product uh, running on a on a micro gas turbine, two megawatt hour storage, uh, and that project is scheduled to run for another two years. Uh, and we're also in product development mode on the pure heat application, which obviously is a little simpler to do. Um, and um, that's all I have to, uh, to say today. I would like to thank uh, my co-founders, uh, my collaborators, um, and I'm ready for questions. I hope I'm on time. Jörg, thank you very much um, for the introduction to redox blocks and uh, the underlying material science and heat transfer and technology. Really, really appreciate the deep dive. So we have um, a number of questions from our audience. Um, let me start it. Uh, let me start with a, a higher level question on the technology itself. So Jörg, um, you showed a slide that talks about the chemical uh, storage via chemistry versus uh, storage mm. via heat. So the, the question just want to clarify. So when you mentioned heat, that is referring to the heat capacity of the material? Yes, that's sensible heat. That's sensible heat. So that's just simply because you're going from 1,000 degrees to 1,500 degrees C, right? There's a significant amount of energy stored uh, as sensible heat, right? And then the chemistry... About and and then there's the the added the added effect of the chemistry, which is which is between sixty around sixty sixty to seventy percent of the overall storage is actually in the chemistry in the right. oxidation and reduction. Right, and and I think uh, for many of our audience, they can appreciate that um, the chemistry part of the heat storage can be quenched. Um, so if you cool it down, uh, the chemistry is right. retained. So can That's you right. talk a little bit about the sort of the various operational modes? Um, right. Sort of if you want to get the most out of it in terms of heat, you have to keep it hot. But if you yeah. want to have a long duration storage, just cool it down, right. let it keep cold. So, so talk a little bit about that. So I don't have this this on this slide. There there is actually this is this is a little how shall I say it? this is a little higher a little further up in the pipeline. Uh, we have 
also at, at Michigan State um, in in a in a separate project that was funded uh, through CETO, uh, DOE uh, Solar Energy. Um, we developed uh, a technology where we're actually uh, recouping, um, where we recouping uh, all the sensible heat. So this is basically a falling bed or or, or falling particle. Uh, tube-like situation with a heated zone and uh, an inert gas in counterflow. And, and so basically, all you have to do is you have to match uh, the M dot CP of the uh, material coming down uh, and the, the counterflow uh, inert, or it actually can contain some, some oxygen, just not too much. Um, you just have to look at the thermodynamics. Um, what sort of the optimal uh, point here, but you can actually drop the whole thing down all the way to ambient. So we have this system where it's basically a tube with a heated zone in the center, uh, air entering, or, or sorry, an inert, typically nitrogen entering at the bottom at ambient, the material entering at the top at ambient, uh, and then and then they exchange heat in in a counterflow. Um, which is really nice. We've we've uh, we've actually uh, published. It's just a little bit beyond what, what I wanted to show here. But you can actually recoup all the heat, and then do long duration storage on this. Thank you, Jorga. To me, this is very exciting because um, then there will be no self discharge whatsoever in the fully. That's part. right. That's um, right. And then if you can also recover all the heat during the cooling and prevent the oxidation of the material, then it would be, you know, the perfect battery for long duration storage. So I think right. this is really exciting. So would you say that the technical challenge there is to prevent the reoxidation of the material uh, on cooling to make sure it doesn't uh, lose any charge um, when you crunch it down? The, the main, the, actually the main challenge that we had to overcome uh, in, in that project was the flowability of the material. At mm -hmm. 1500 degrees C, everything becomes a little sticky. Uh, there is some some sintering tendency, not a very strong one, but but it it we have just we experienced logging from time to time, um, and really getting the 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 pellet size, the particle size right. Uh, we're working with with a different pellet geometry on 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 the stores on our redox blocks technology. We're mostly working with cylindrical pellets because it gives us somewhat better packing. Uh, as opposed to 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 the what we we call it the so fuel technology um, uh, that is spherical particles they just have better flowability um, you have to get the flow rates right um, I would say flowability has been a challenge that we we have pretty much overcome now um, once it's at ambient uh, of course like theoretically it's not thermodynamically stable, right? It would want to oxidize, uh, but you can actually let it sit for in the charge state for for half a year, and you will not you will not have measurable oxidation. The kinetics are, are far too slow, so it's just it will it will oxidize, but in a million years. Really. Well, that sounds terrific. Yeah, I'm, this is the part that really excites me, and um, what, what I think one aspect of this um, is. One aspect of this um, low self-discharge rate, um, I'm trying to understand how this could impact the system economics. So maybe we can move on to the second question, which is, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the technical economics here? Um, how right. do these, uh, advantages uh, contribute to the uh, economics of, of this process? Right, right. So um, the system storage system cost and I'm talking about the redox technology here, um, is um, depending on whether you're going, going for the, the grid scale application where you need, where, where you, you have a turbine and you need a pressure vessel, uh, then like at very large scales, uh, the estimated costs are around $10 per kilowatt hour. Uh, once you go to somewhat smaller systems, uh, we're talking more like $20 uh, per kilowatt hour for a pure heat application, uh, we're we're because the pressure vessel is about forty percent of of the of the cost of the system, um, and then there's sealing and other stuff that you don't have to do in 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 a pure heat application. We're down to four or five 
uh, dollars a kilowatt hour, uh, which I, I think is very competitive. And, and, and the main reason is just the low cost of the, of the underlying storage materials. And the storage materials make, make more than 80% of the overall system mass. And York, just to um, confirm, so this is the total system cost. Um, so, storage. no, this is, so this is this is the storage. This is the cost for for the storage system. Yes, without the turbine, of course. Uh, and and you would see that that if you if you uh, had an integrated system, just to give you a rough idea, uh, for ten hours of storage, the storage uh, would be depending on the size, but between between 10 and 15% of the overall system cost uh, and and the bulk of, or the, 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 the main contribution to capital cost would just be the turbine. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, the fact that during charging, at least, that you have to go to this high temperature and right. requiring more specialized materials for your enclosure uh, right. and reactor, how much does that add to the cost? It's so so this is actually um, it's not as bad as it sounds because because basically it's fire brick, right? So it's like it's the, the construction is 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 in many ways similar to a blast furnace, right? Which, which is there's a metal casing, which is a just a, a mild carbon steel, and then there's there's uh, there's ceramic insulation and and it, it, what is essentially fire brick. You can actually use the magnesium manganese oxide itself. Uh, as as uh, as the innermost protective layer because it's a high temperature material it won't melt up to uh, two thousand degrees C so so it's and and that is cheap in itself right great let's get two more questions um, so these are a little bit more specific. Um, so we have a question on the heat up of the material from room temperature on a coat start. Um, yes. <laughs> so the schematic illustrates uh, um, conduction through the material, electrical conduction through the material as the way of transferring right. heat from electricity. So how does a coat start look like? So that is an excellent question. Um, you Because you have to somehow boost, bootstrap it. Bootstrap it, and uh, the way we're we're currently doing this is by basically running hot air over the system. In a large scale system, uh, you would uh, inject a combustible gas, be it natural gas or be it uh, be it hydrogen, uh, and combust that flamelessly in the pec bed. We've actually done experiments showing that that's compatible and, and there's no problems with doing that. So you, you basically have a large porous burner and you only have to do that once, right? You only do that when you start up the system. And then, and then maintaining, maintaining um, the system at temperature is something you would do with a high temperature thermal system if you can anyways, because High temperature ceramics, fire bricks don't like to be cycled. It's something that that you know in in a in a blast furnace or or similar application is something you don't want to do anyways. Um, and you basically have to um, and also to use your capital well, you want to cycle the system uh, relatively often. Let's say on a daily basis, right? Um, so you can trickle charge the system at at approximately one percent uh, of the capacity uh, per day. Which is not terrible. So for a for a for a um, let's say one megawatt, let's nominally one. It's a couple couple kilowatt for a for a several megawatt hour system. Very so it's not it's not, but it's still something. Yeah, we have to be aware. It does not affect the economics of the system very much, uh, but it's a very it's a very good question. Thank you, York. I think E will have the last question. E, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks, Will. Hi, Yoga. Really interesting technology. Very nice talk. Uh, what's the round trip efficiency here? Considering for storage, let's right? see. You have electricity coming in, right? right. You, you you heat up the system. You uh, oxidize that, and then oxygen release because you heat it up, and then let's say you store this energy over a month. You know, this whole thing cool down. And then you come back, you discharge. Uh, what's the round trip efficiency? Uh, so, so in the just to clarify, in in the application here, uh, we would not let it sit over month. We would do that in the in in the system where we where we actually quench it down all 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 to 
uh, all down to ambient, you would do that. You would let you would do something like seasonal storage. In this case, we're more talking about about daily or weekly storage, right? So to to overcome either your typical time scales associated with solar energy or with wind, right? With, with solar energy, it's basically a day. With wind, it it it's the the sort of the variance can be a little longer. It can be up to a week. Um, but but that's sort of what, what we're seeing here. The round trip efficiency is uh, if you if you charge and discharge uh, once a day uh, is basically dominated by the efficiency of your thermal cycle. So if you have a if you have a, a simple uh, gas turbine cycle, simple rating cycle, you know between thirty and forty percent, and then the storage efficiency is is between ninety five and ninety eight percent. Uh, depending on the size of the system, right? You, the larger you make it, uh, the better it is. Uh, 95% is if you do not recoup any of the heat that's uh, that's in the oxygen that you suck out. Oxygen is, is about 5% of the mass. So if you lose all that heat, which, which in a large system you wouldn't do, you would be able to recoup some of it. And we've even built that in into our 100 kilowatt hour system. We have sort of a, like a basically a, a, a ceramic sensible heat storage that uses that that uses some of the heat uh, of the oxygen that's sucked out. Uh, so it's it's 95 to 98 percent times the efficiency of your uh, of your cycle. So you know 40 to 60 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. York, thanks again for this wonderful introduction. Uh, personal, I find the technology very interesting because I was working on this process also about 20 years ago for a different purpose. I'm glad that it has found a new life um, in terms of application. I think the most exciting part is just that there's so many use cases. You can keep it hot, keep it warm, you can keep it cold. Um, and, and really, the duration of storage is entirely flexible uh, using the various operation modes. So very excited to follow the progress of Redox Blocks uh, in the coming months thank and you. years. York, thank you thank so you. much again. So thank now, you very much for thank me. you. Thank you, York. We'll come back to you for our panel discussion. So um, stay right there. Uh, let me ask Ashley now to come to the stage. So for our second talk, again, very much building on this concept of thermal storage and thermal batteries, uh, we're really delighted to have Ashton Henry from the Mechanical Engineering Department at MIT. Um, I've known Ashton for quite a while, and um, I think the best way to introduce him is that uh, he is a theoretician turned to crazy experimentalist. <laughs> I think that's a pretty fair statement. Um, you know, starting with just working with atoms in the computer to building these crazy, um, you know, high temperature devices and, and looking at very unusual implementation for or for thermodynamic cycles. Uh, and I think um, you know, Ashe was exposed to the technology aspect when he was uh, in the first cohort of ARPA-E fellows uh, many years ago, uh, where he worked very closely uh, with uh, now our dean of um, our new school of sensibility, uh, Aruma Jamdar. Uh, and I believe that really influenced his thinking and, and sort of migrated him slightly from pure theory to crazy experiments <laughs> as well. And, and Asha has been working on many applications of heat transfer and thermal storage, and also just fundamentals of heat transport in materials. Uh, so, Asha, we're really, really delighted to hear about the latest and greatest coming out of your lab at MIT. Asha, yeah, floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, introduction and uh, another piece of connection, right? Will and I got to know each other. We started on a project also on redox uh, cycles, and so uh, that's, uh, that's how we started together. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about a technology uh, we call thermal batteries. Um, that we've been developing in my lab for, uh, I'll call it about 10 years. Actually, kind of the genesis was this project that I worked on with Will. Um, and essentially what has happened over 10 years is there have been three very uh, significant technological steps forward. Um, and I'll review what they are. They have ultimately resulted in the recent uh, foundation of a, a new startup company. I founded a company called Thermal Battery Corporation. Um, we are hiring like mad. Uh, so if you're interested in the technology, um, if you're a clever, creative, uh, high energy uh, engineer committed to uh, mitigating climate change, please do not hesitate to send an email to um, info at thermalbattery.com. 
we are uh, very interested in hiring the best and brightest. So I'm going to review the concept itself, talk about some of the economics and um, experimental data, things that we've done to date to walk you through these three big steps forward in terms of um, kind of breakthroughs in the technology itself. All right, so before I dig into that, I'll just show one slide of background and context. Uh, I think, I presume the audience is familiar with the storage problem. Um, however, I will mention three pieces of terminology that I'll use throughout this, this particular talk um, when we talk about cost. So, so real quick, the slide on the right is basically just showing a, um, a composite image of composite data taken really from the three papers cited on the bottom left. Uh, essentially, what it says is that a couple of independent studies here have shown um, that one of the most important uh, quantities in the energy storage problem is what we call the cost per unit energy. We label it CPE. What it is is the CapEx, the capital expenditure associated with all the components in, energy, in an energy storage system that scale with the amount of storage you have. So in our case with thermal batteries, and in, is the case for many different technologies, um, particularly ones that are not just regular electrochemical batteries, you can have it where the amount of energy you store is a separable uh, decision you make, a uh, separable design um, parameter from the charging rate and the discharging rate. Um, and so those, we separate the costs because you can scale these things independently. Um, and so what the studies have identified is that the cost per unit energy, specifically the amount that it costs to store more energy, is one of the most critical and important parameters. Uh, what's shown here is <clears throat> what's estimated as the amount of penetration we can see of renewables onto the grid as a function of this cost per unit energy for the storage technology that you deploy to store the energy. And uh, there are, of course, a, a number of assumptions that go into this. Right, right now, we're at about 25% or so. Um, globally, um, but uh, in order to get to the high 90s and up to 100%, we need uh, essentially more than an order of magnitude decrease in cost compared to lithium ion. So I think one thing that is clear to many of us that work in this space is that lithium ion won't get us there, uh, won't be enough, uh, and that we need some essentially radically new or very different type of approach to storage in order to get the cost down. The second uh, important parameter is what we call the cost per unit power. We label it CPP. This is the uh, capital expenditure associated with all the components that scale with how fast you charge it or discharge it. And so power and energy are, are different. Uh, you could, in theory, have a thermal battery uh, with lots of energy stored, hundreds of hours of storage. Uh, and only discharges at 10 megawatts. You can also make one that charges at 100 megawatts and discharges at 10 megawatts. So each of these things is separable, but at the end of the day, we label all the capital expenditure associated with how fast we can charge and discharge the equipment that, that facilitates that, we label that as the CPP. And then you have the round trip efficiency or RTE, which is total electricity that comes back out of the battery after you charge it. Um, so you charge it up, you spend some amount of kilowatt hours doing that, you discharge it, a certain number of kilowatt hours come, kilowatt hours come out, the output divided by input is what we call round trip efficiency. And then the other key parameter in the economics is the lifetime, how long it lives, how long you can, how many times you can cycle it. Um, we usually represent that in years. And uh, in our case, we expect that thermal batteries should be able to last 30 years or more. So uh, these studies have essentially concluded a couple of things. Um, they all come to similar conclusions, which is that CPE is the most important. One of the most interesting things, which is what really sparked us to think about moving in this direction, is that the round trip efficiency has to be above roughly 35% or so in order to get money um, to make some profit from more arbitrage. Um, but it does not have to be super high. So batteries. Uh, of course, pumped hydro all are up in the 80 to 90 percent range in, each, in terms of round trip efficiency, but you can sacrifice efficiency if it buys you much lower cost. And so that's the direction that much of the field is moving in. And specifically, you know, we should need to try to get to cost below $20 a kilowatt hour. So let me talk to you about how the technology itself works. It's going to sound, um, if you've taken a thermodynamics class, it's going to sound absolutely idiotic. We take electricity, we convert that to heat, and store it as heat, only to take another thermodynamic penalty, converting it back to electricity again. 
uh, but there is good reason to do so, which is exactly what I mentioned on the prior slide. We can take, you know, to it, it is advantageous economically to take a hit on efficiency of let's say 50% if it buys you an order of magnitude reduction in cost. The order of magnitude is more important than the factor of two. And so um, the way we do this in our concept is we can take electricity from any source. We are specifically interested and focused on it being a renewable resource, uh, but is essentially a technology is agnostic. Uh, and what we do with that electricity is we run resistive heaters. Now these resistive heaters are operated at extremely high temperature, essentially the same temperature you have inside of an incandescent light bulb, which is about 2,500 degrees Celsius, uh, much higher than uh, than most things that you could ever find in any technological um, any technology used at an industrial scale. So extremely high temperature. We run those heating elements so hot so that they can heat something else super hot. And what we use to um, to heat up is we actually use a liquid metal as a heat transfer fluid. Its purpose is simply to move heat from one location to the, to another. It is not our actual storage medium. And so what we have is graphite tubing. Graphite is nice because it is uh, able to be used up till 3000 degrees C or more. We're not going that hot. Uh, we actually, our peak temperature is 2400 degrees Celsius. Uh, but we use liquid tin as the liquid metal. And the reason we chose liquid tin is it's uh, very safe, non-toxic, uh, low cost compared to something else like gallium, low melting point, high boiling point of 2600 C, melts at 232 C. And the most special thing about tin is that it does not chemically interact with carbon. So we don't have any corrosion in our system and we're able to pump liquid tin inside of a graphite infrastructure without experiencing corrosion. So that's the main reason for that uh, choice of materials. And that simplifies our life. So the challenge for us was then trying to make a system entirely out of graphite. Our entire system is essentially made out of one material. It's all carbon. It's different types of carbon. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's essentially one element. Another key point is that our entire system is housed inside of an inert environment. So there are warehouses that they build for fruit storage, like apples. You can hold apples in an argon or nit nitrogen environment and keep them fresh for like six months or more. Uh, there are facilities, there are companies that make those kind of uh, storage rooms and facilities. We envision putting our entire system inside of one, uh, building an entire inert warehouse that'll keep all of our components from oxidizing. And so this is a key piece of our technology is we keep oxygen out of the system. So our entire system in, uh, operates in an inert environment. That gives us great flexibility, long life, uh, great flexibility in the materials that we choose because we don't think about whether or not it's going to oxidize. Um, so what happens is you run these resistive heaters. Uh, the liquid metal comes in at about 1900 degrees Celsius, which is already glowing white hot. We heat it up with these resistive heaters all the way up to 2400 degrees Celsius, and we are mechanically pumping it. We actually have pumps that operate at these temperatures and we can mechanically pump it over to our storage unit, which is shown here on the left. The storage unit consists of a different type of carbon, very inexpensive carbon, which are just graphite blocks, cost in the range of 50 cents to a dollar a kilogram. And we have uh, the tin contained in dense walled graphite tubing that runs in between the blocks. And as the tin is pumped through here, transfers the heat to the blocks, heating the blocks up to that peak temperature of 2400 C. So when all the blocks reach 2400 C, that's when the thermal battery is fully charged. Then later, when you now want electricity, you pump the liquid metal through to retrieve that heat and move it over to the power block. The power block in our case is a big departure from what's normally done. Typically, people would use a turbine. Turbines are the most efficient heat engines on Earth. There's some good reasons why we don't go with the turbine that I'll review, but uh, suffice it to say, our, our major departure here is that we actually use photovoltaics to convert the energy, the heat, back to electricity. And how we do it is by converting the light coming off of the piping. So we push the temperature so high so that the light source is super intense and it allows us to use very efficient, um, more expensive PV cells. So technically these are what are called thermal photovoltaic cells. Uh, sometimes we also call them MPV cells because they're generally multi-junction cells. So we try to boost the efficiency as much as possible. So we're almost wholly performance driven. 
These PV cells are not normal cells. These have cell. These cells have mirrors on the back. Um, and so what we do is we don't try to convert the majority of the light. We only try to convert the highest frequency light, the op, the visible light that, uh, that we can convert very efficiently. The rest of the light goes through the cell because the cell is transparent to it. It reflects off of the mirror and goes back to the hot infrastructure and it gets preserved inside the system. Uh, in a sense, it's like containing the sun inside of a box. And so it's like we make our own terrestrial sun uh, and then we contain it inside of a box of insulation. Uh, and so any energy that we don't convert, we then send right back to it to help keep it hot. These cells are not running at high temperature. These cells are water-cooled, so they stay cold near room temperature. And that waste heat is then dissipated in a dry cooling unit outside. Now, one of the most important features, <clears throat> uh, one thing that'll come up a little bit later as I talk about, you'll see here, it looks like uh, metal fins that are in here. We don't really need fins as much as we do need this metal layer here. So this is the one part of this hot side of the system that's not made from carbon. This is actually tungsten here. And so we use uh, tungsten foil to be a to act as the surface that's radiating the light to the PV. The reason for that is that carbon's vapor pressure at these temperatures is quite significant. And if you put something that hot next to, you know, just a couple inches away from something at room temperature, what you've basically made is an evaporator and you'll gradually move carbon from the hot side and deposit it on the PV. The PV will get coated in carbon and you won't be able to uh, get the light in. And so instead we use tungsten, tungsten foil. Tungsten's got about four order magnitude lower vapor pressure than carbon does. And that's the reason it's used in incandescent light bulbs. So this helps us. It's a very important aspect of the system. And the other piece is that these PV cells are mounted on an actuator. So this water-cooled heat sink can be actuated in and out of the light, similar to a control rod in a nuclear power plant. So we can ramp from fully off to fully on very quickly, as quickly as we can actuate the PV cells into the light. This in particular has very, very large advantages and uh, is a very much of interest for utilities to be able to ramp that quickly, uh, to be able to do load following and to be able to provide emergency services as needed. Um, <clears throat> the cost of our uh, technology is estimated to be a little bit below $10 a kilowatt hour. I'll show you that on the next slide. To understand why the cost is that low, um, best to dig into why the, uh, uh, the the source of the low cost is ultimately that the storage medium itself is very low cost. So this is like the lower bound. Uh, of course, there's a bunch of other costs to add to this to build a system around it. Uh, but the starting point helps you see why the cost is so low in the first place. Um, so let's talk about this cost per unit energy. How you can compute that is you just simple estimate, take this cost of the graphite, the cheap graphite, 50 cents a kilogram and divided by the amount of energy stored in every kilogram, which is the heat capacity, 2000 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, multiplied by the temperature swing. As I mentioned before, we're swinging the temperature from 1900 C up to 2400 C, so that's a 500 degree C window, so 500 Kelvin here. And our estimated round trip efficiency, is 50%. And so we take another hit. So what we're storing is elect what we want is electricity. So we have to pay another penalty. That thermodynamic penalty shows up here. And this comes out to 10 to the minus six dollars per joule, which is essentially uh, $3.6 per kilowatt hour. And you can see by comparison to lithium ion, uh, much, much lower. This gets us in that range of one to two order of magnitudes lower. Uh, and this is this is what the starting point is, and it's the reason we think about going and committing this like thermodynamic crime of going from electricity back to heat only to go to electricity again. Now, when you start adding up the rest of the costs, um, you add up this inert containment, the pumps, the piping, the cooling, the insulation, construction, all these different things, of course, add to the cost, and they are, in fact, more expensive than the storage medium itself. But even once you add all that, it still comes out a little bit less than $10 a kilowatt hour, which is what makes it very, very exciting. Uh, it's one of the only technologies we're aware of that gets to this low, uh, low cost range, um, in addition to, I guess, as what I've just heard with uh, redox blocks as well. And then <clears throat> the other portion of the cost is the cost per unit power. The cost of a turbine is close to like a dollar a watt. And so we see some major cost savings by using the PV. Uh, because the light source is so intense, because we've gone so high in temperature, the PV cost is close to like 10 cents a watt. Uh, but again, you've got to add all kinds of other things. You need an inverter. You need that dry cooling unit. Those are two of the big costs that actually uh, 
uh, affect our total cost, but it still comes out to less than about 35 cents a watt. So this, uh, this cost of uh, about a third that of a turbine is what really has drive, drove, driven us to using PV as opposed to um, a turbine. This system does have the option to one day use a turbine instead. We could turn the temperature down. The graphite heat capacity doesn't change that much. We could uh, conceivably decrease the uh, temperature to the range that would be more suitable for a turbine and use a turbine. Uh, but it seems as though PV is actually cheaper, and so we're focused on that. It's also something we think we can commercialize faster. Uh, one of the big key things to recognize with this is this is thermal storage. The bigger, the better. Uh, what drives our cost to uh, want to go very large in scale is the cost of that insulation. So uh, one of the, the only option you have if you want to insulate something uh, with uh, conductive insulation above, um, let's say, about 1700 C, um, all the oxides will center and fall apart. The only option is really carbon fiber based insulation. That ex insulation is quite expensive. It is not too expensive for our system, um, but as you can see, as we go bigger, the skin, the surface area is where you lose the heat. That starts to shrink in comparison to the total volume of energy that you're storing inside as you go bigger. And so this is one of the most important costs for us is the, um, is the cost of the insulation. And that's one of the biggest drivers for us to go to very large scale. Now, the second thing you might think is sounds absolutely insane is uh, I mentioned that we're pumping liquid metal at 2000 degrees Celsius. Um, as of about six or seven years ago, that was not considered uh, possible. Um, this was the first, I would say, technological breakthrough that really set off a chain of events when we were able to do this. This was actually in the project that I was involved with that I led that uh, Will was a part of. We initially were thinking about doing a thermal chemical reactor that involved liquid metal pumping. We then moved to concentrated solar power, uh, doing liquid metals, and then eventually to thermal batteries. Uh, but at the end of the day, the core shift in thinking, uh, and this is, as Will mentioned, um, started as a theorist. Uh, and from a theoretical perspective, you know, heat used at extremely high temperatures is, can be similarly valuable to electricity itself, has the advantage that it can be stored uh, much more easily or much more at much lower cost. Um, but the challenge um, is that we don't really have a thermal infrastructure for moving heat at much higher temperatures. Um, once you go above about six, 700 degrees C, most of the thermal infrastructures are made out of metals like steel, nickel alloy is more expensive, uh, but we do have materials like ceramics that can go much hotter, but it had generally been uh, assumed and believed that you can't really use those kinds of materials to build a mechanical system with seals and moving parts. Um, but we challenged that assumption, and this is why it was a significant breakthrough. Uh, this here is a little excerpt and a video from our first time pumping liquid tin at 1400 degrees C. Uh, the materials and the, the loop could have gone hotter than that, um, but we actually stopped at 1400 C because we ran out of heater power, and we ran out of heater power because we cut a hole in the insulation so we could see it pumping. At this time, when we first did this, we didn't have flow meters that operated at 1400 C. Um, but we've since invented flow meters that now work, so we don't have to look at it to know that it's flowing and to measure the flow rate. Uh, but this was the first big breakthrough. This pump was a gear pump made out of aluminum nitride. And um, we've since moved on to doing pumps exclusively made out of carbon, made out of graphite, that are centrifugal sump pumps that operate even better than this uh, and can go all the way to 2400C as we're interested in going in thermal batteries. Um, I'll skip through a lot of this more quickly, um, just to move ahead a bit faster. One of the main reasons that we use PV is because we can get similar efficiencies to what we can get with a turbine. Um, this slide walks you through the basic uh, energy balance. You can see why 50% is not unreasonable. This is using realistic properties of PV cells. Uh, so what's shown on the left is uh, if we take the nominal intermediate temperature for us. So we're swinging between 1900 C, 2400 C. So halfway in the middle is 2150. So everything shown here on this slide uh, on the left here is actually associated with the 2150 spectrum. The spectrum doesn't shift all that much over this 500 degree C window, but the intensity of the lights shifts significantly. So you get more power density at 2400 C than 1900 C, even though the spectrum is, is rather similar. 
Um, but what you see here is black body radiation shown in black. What's radiating to RPV is actually tungsten. So it's a shiny metal. So we actually get much less light coming out of the tungsten. So that's shown here in gray. And then what we're trying to convert is the stuff in orange and red. So we try to convert what's to the left of the peak of the spectrum. So that's about 30% of the light. Um, the rest of this infrared is what goes through the cell. Some of it does get parasitically absorbed. Um, we're trying to reduce that down to about 2%. If we get to about 2%, uh, absorption below the band gap, then we will get to our 50% efficiency. Right now, that number is more like six or 7%. So that's one of the things we're working on is increasing uh, the efficiency by reducing the parasitic absorption in the cells. But to show it to you here, this is tungsten's emission. We are only, only about 213 kilowatts per square meter is what's above the band gap. If you look at black body, it's about two megawatts per square meter. So extremely intense light once you get above 2000 C. This is what makes our system very power dense and also keeps the cost low. Um, most of this light here, 70% or so of the light that you can see goes through the cell, just gets reflected by the back surface reflector, that gold mirror on the back. A little bit of that is absorbed uh, parasitically. So you get some absorption. This is waste heat. This is also waste heat, QGen inside the cell because we're operating at pretty high current. And the output power is about 100 kilowatts per square meter. So that's about the power density of what's coming out. Up here, if you now calculate the efficiency, so you can take that 123 divided by the 123 coming out, plus the heat generation, the parasitic absorption. And this 4.6 is what you lose due to convection. So we are not running our system in vacuum. We actually have uh, argon gas in there, and that argon gas will gradually convect heat from the hot side to the cold side, that's about another 4.6 kilowatts per square meter. Ultimately, it comes out to about 50%. It's a little bit above 50% efficiency. And so um, the other key thing I want to show on this slide is why we use multi-junction. You can see if we use one junction uh, versus two, you get about a 5% overall boost in efficiency. Uh, and so this is uh, not a large increment in cost. Once you grow one cell junction using MOCVD, Growing a second cell junction is not that much more expensive, yet you get significant benefits on the efficiency. Um, another, the second key uh, breakthrough, so to speak, or, or, or significant advance we've had in our, um, in our work has been of late. We had a paper come out in Nature earlier this year where we set a new record for the thermophotovoltaic uh, efficiency. So, uh, Dick Swanson at Stanford um, set a record back in the 1980s, um, right around 30%. And if you look at the TPV literature over the last 40 years or so, uh, most of the efficiencies were actually below his work. Um, and just recently in the last year or so, got to about 32%. We did this approach that I mentioned with multi-junction cells, a high quality mirror on the back and push the temperature of the emitter, the emitter up to above 2000 C, and then we get to a peak efficiency of 41%. Uh, this efficiency is not just at the peak temperature. You can see we can get uh, close to 40% efficiency over the temperature range of interest. We've got a couple different kinds of cells that we've made. Um, this has been in collaboration with um, Miles Steiner um, and Dan Friedman at NREL and, some, and, uh, and Kevin Schulte. Um, <clears throat> we've been uh, and a great collaboration over the last few years and um, uh, really excited that, that they've been able to demonstrate uh, cells that have a higher efficiency than, um, than what we've seen previously. And this is really what uh, got us prompted, uh, got me prompted to go ahead and found a startup company is once I knew that the cells would work and um, get to a range that's actually higher efficiency than what's needed to make money from arbitrage, then it became interesting to look at starting a company because I know I know that we've kind of crossed the last checkbox of what, what the system needs to work. Uh, what's also intriguing about this, again, previously TBV efficiency is around 32%. The average efficiency of a turbine in the United States is about 34%. And so this is the first time, uh, to my knowledge, that a solid state heat engine has actually eclipsed the efficiency of an average turbine. And so turbines have always been the go-to choice for, um, for converting heat to electricity, um, largely because of their cost effectiveness and their high efficiency. Now TPV should, should enter that discussion in, in some cases where it may make sense. 
um, TPV should be something that, that others look at. And it's definitely something we're focused on. One of the other reasons I want to point out that we're focused on uh, TPV is specifically because of the lower barrier to deployment. So developing, um, if we wanted a turbine that's going to operate in an inert environment um, at these kinds of temperatures, even if we go down to 1400 C, uh, that's a $100 million plus R&D effort. Conversely, there are companies in this space already that are very interested in working with us to develop the multi-junction PV that we need. Um, uh, much lower cost, and um, they're getting a lot, a lot of good response in that, in that field. Uh, this is just a conceptual depiction, so you can get a sense for what a system would look like. This is a gigawatt hour battery here, so 100 megawatts times 10 hours of storage. Um, each sub-component or subsystem in the, in the entire system can have its own inert warehouse so that, for example, the pumps and, uh, and valves could be serviced more frequently, uh, have their own uh, mini storage unit or mini uh, inert environment. The storage can be its own place. The power block and the heater in their own place. The biggest portion of the system in terms of footprint is actually the dry cooling unit. Uh, now let me briefly review some of the experiments and things that we've been doing in my lab over the last 10 years to kind of led up to this, uh, this technology and the founding of the company. Um, so we've built a test rig that operates inside a vacuum chamber. We, we pull vacuum just to be able to get the gas out very quickly, but then we backfill with argon. So we run at about one atmosphere of argon. We've got a system where we've got a graphite heater surrounded with carbon insulation and also some oxide insulation. Initially, we ran with, uh, we've got the tungsten lined cavity, and then we've got an actuated set of, uh, an actuated heat sink that we put PV cells on that we can put in the cavity take measurements and, uh, and demonstrate aspects of the technology. I'll move through this rather quickly. You can see here heating elements. We make our own custom heating elements, uh, get them machined out of graphite. Um, uh, this is the carbon fiber insulation you see here that the system rests on. You can get rigid insulation that, that, that can support the weight of, of different objects. Um, this is us building the cavity. This is a cavity at 2000 C. Uh, again, the 2000 degree C cavity in this image is about a foot back. So what you're seeing is just the light that makes it out of the cavity coming out here. Uh, extremely bright, but this is uh, us using our actuator with our water-cooled heat sink that can go inside and carry a cell. So we can take measurements. Now let me get to this point about the deposition problem. <clears throat> so if you operate at 2150C, you put a heat sink inside of a cavity doesn't take but a few minutes, you put it in. If you don't have the tungsten liner and you don't do something I'm gonna show you that we do to protect the cells or to protect the heat sink, uh, within minutes, you'll pull it out and it'll actually be coated in carbon. Um, and you'll see lots of, lots of black stuff. This would of course coat the PV and keep it from being able to operate. And this was one of the key problems uh, that has existed with this technology. <clears throat> and one of the reasons why uh, I think it hasn't existed previously. If people going to these high temperatures, most TPV work is done around 14, 1500 C or even lower, um, and largely to avoid this issue. What we did is we figured out that what you could do instead, and we have a, a patent on this, is to uh, instead, since I teach heat and mass transfer, an obvious solution is you actually blow gas. You need something that's transparent to the light that can physically move atoms out of the way. Uh, without impeding the light moving through it. And so why not use a gas? So instead, what we do is we blow gas over the surface of, PV, of the PV, keep a thin layer of gas that sweeps away anything that would deposits, we can keep the PV clean and we just recycle it and filter it. So this is a uh, nice kind of CAD image. You can see we have on our heat sink this approach of the sweeping noble gas curtain, the SNGC integrated into our heat sink. We bring in uh, cooling water, have that return and also bring in cooling gas that we pull from the ambient environment, blow through here, it blows over out this uh, gas cap over the cells and comes back in, it gets sucked back in and pulled out. And so we um, uh, were able to do this on all four sides and we have this all fully integrated in our system. We also use tungsten foil. Um, this again gives us a four order of magnitude shift down in vapor pressure. This also helps suppress this, uh, this effect dramatically. And we have some initial test data here showing. Um, so we can put our PV cells in the uh, cavity at over 2000 C for over six hours. We see uh, very little <clears throat> impact, if any, on the uh, PV. So this is us 
doing a measurement, same way we did the measurement of the PV efficiency. This is an IV curve for a PV cell uh, done before and after sitting in the cavity for six hours. So we were able to prevent this deposition issue and this ultimately allows us to operate at these extreme temperatures. So I'll, I'll pretty much stop here. Uh, what we're doing now in my lab at MIT, we're building a fully integrated prototype between one to 10 kilowatt hours with graphite storage and all these various components uh, with pumping that can go through the full cycles and show the emitter deposition protection. Um, and we'll do some long-term testing with this and hope to get another um, high profile paper out of this that'll show showcase that the whole thing works when you put it together. At the same time, I founded a company, Thermal Battery Corporation. Uh, we're building a one megawatt hour pilot demonstration. Uh, it'll consist of a single repeat unit, as you may have seen on the slide showing the full scale depiction. You've got blocks. We're essentially going to show and demonstrate one block that is then like a repeat unit with the appropriately sized pumps and heaters and uh, PV sticks that go down into the light. Um, so we'll show, you know, a set of graphite blocks that can then be repeated to build up to larger and larger systems without having to requalify the hardware. So uh, I'll stop there and be excited to take any questions that you may have. And just one more time, if anyone is interested uh, in learning more about the technology, feel free to contact us at info at thermalbattery.com. And particularly if anyone's interested in possibly joining the company, do not hesitate to reach out. Ashe, thank you so much for that presentation and for the deep dive. Always uh, interesting to see how you piece together different part of your research uh, to come up with the grand technology. Um, I think we have time for one quick question. Um, so I think what is really novel here is the addition of the high temperature thermal transfer fluid here. And you touch upon some of the advantages, but I was wondering if you can also expand on other advantages of this decoupling uh, beyond what you have talked about. So if you separate the power block from the energy storage block spatially, and also to some extent um, uh, chemically, what advantages can you have um, that would not be possible if the uh, TPV was inside your yeah. Um, yeah. energy storage block? Yeah, so the I would say the biggest advantage is that it allows us to independently size each subsystem so we could operate at you know 100 megawatts in one hour storage so we can compete directly with lithium ion on the one hour storage regime we also have the ability to go out to 100 hours of storage so we can explore the full range and resizing our system it also allows us to uh, decouple the charging and discharging rate so we could for example design a thermal battery to have a you know, five megawatt discharge rate and a 500 megawatt charging rate. There are some initial studies we've done show that actually there's some really huge economic advantages to being able to do that because particularly early on when we see re more renewable penetration, you have very few batteries on the grid. And so when you have lots of solar that's overproducing, you have the ability to charge and take up all this electricity that essentially would have a negative price use it and store it and then trickle it back to the grid at a lower rate later when the grid needs it. So there's great advantages to being able to separate out charging and discharging. The third big advantage has to do with servicing the system. So by having separate buildings, separate, <clears throat> uh, separate <clears throat> containment vessels uh, allows us to separately go ahead and shut down portions of the system. So the beautiful thing about tin is it doesn't, it melts as low as uh, 232 degrees Celsius. Now, the reason that's special, that's about the same temperature as molten salt. You can, you can melt uh, the liquid tin with a heat gun. Um, you can do a variety of things that allow us to actually use the liquid metal to pull the temperature of, the, of a portion of the system down to where you can operate or where a human being can go and touch it with, with just some gloves. Um, the liquid could even, you could even keep it in liquid state there, or you can drain a section and put it back without having to go to really, really high temperatures to get it reheated and get it uh, put back in. And there's some nice overlap between the temperature where you melt tin, which is 232C, it's like solder, uh, and the temperature where like the peak temperature you can use like heat transfer oils, which is like 400C. So you could actually use some oils to actually preheat the system, get it up to temperature, then bring in liquid metal and do the rest of the preheating up to temperature and then bring it down. You can do all kinds of things by having liquid metal as a transport fluid. Ashley, this is very exciting. So 
Um, in terms of economics, obviously you have to pay a price uh, in CapEx to add this transfer fluid. Um, what determines the tipping point when this becomes worthwhile? What are the, the benefits that you have to get out of it to increase the complexity of the system? Uh, that's an interesting way of framing it. Um, so that, so in order to, so I would say it's at the outset, it makes sense. I guess the only place where there's a tipping point is if it turns out that for whatever reason, the liquid metal infrastructure is not long lived, right? So, so it's cost, uh, let me maybe pull up a slide. Actually, let me go back to the slide that had the economics. You can see the cost of the 10 infrastructure is actually not um, very significant. Um, it's kind of negligible. Let me see mm. where we are. So it's really the lifetime of the infrastructure. It's, yeah, I mean, if, if for whatever reason, uh, so where we at, transfer fluid. So you can see here the transfer fluid is pretty small um, by comparison to everything else. So it's not a big deal for us to use tin. It gives us great advantages, great economic advantages, servicing advantages, decoupling advantages. Um, so that's so what you what you'd save is I guess an extra fifty cents a kilowatt hour, right? <laughs> to not have the tin, uh, mm -hmm. but what it what it what it buys you is a lot of flexibility, and that's I think the one unanimous uh, request and feedback we've always heard from the utility industry is they want flexibility. They want the ability to do different things um, and being able to pull out, I guess I'll say this, the other thing is being able to pull the PV out of the storage, um, I guess by comparison to what I, I understand Antora is doing, also allows us to have the very fast ramp rate. So we can fully pull our PV out, have our liquid metal running and our, our heat sources ready. And then when we're ready, we can dip in and get very, um, very quick ramp up of output. Um, so there's a lot of, another advantage with that is the liquid metal allows us a second degree of flexibility in how we discharge. So we've actually done some studies, we're gonna publish some papers soon showing you could actually, um, so when you think about sensible storage, right, this thing is gonna gradually cool off. And what you would think is that you're gonna get a big drop off in power density as the storage cools off. But with liquid metal, you can discharge portions of the system in series so that you can actually have a constant output power almost the entire discharge. And so you can actually save the last few blocks that are at the peak temperature and have them discharge last. And you can have a very nice square looking profile for the power output. And the PV dipping in actually helps you compensate for that. And so um, you can vary the liquid metal flow rate to achieve that. So a uh, lot of flexibility is I think what, what the liquid metal buys us. Excellent, Ashley. I think, um, you know, I've seen a lot of different types of energy storage solutions, but I think this is the closest it gets to a thermal flow battery. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is really a thermal flow battery. This is very and, and it's the opposite extreme of power density. It's extreme right. power density, right? <laughs> exactly. And you have the true decoupling uh, yeah. afforded by the flowing aspect. Um, right. But yeah, we will have uh, your colleague, Vic Bruchette, speak in a, in a couple of weeks about electrochemical flow batteries. Um, so this is, I, I think I'm really glad to see the intersection of these two ideas. Well, um, thank you very much, Ashley. If I can also ask York to rejoin us, uh, we have uh, about 20 minutes for a discussion uh, amongst the three of us. And typically in this section, um, we try to, to weave uh, the two presentations together and identify some common points. So maybe I'll start. I, I think what is really exciting in today's talks is that we are looking at the intersection of you know, three to four main pieces, right? Uh, electrical, thermal, optical. Um, and um, I, I think this is sort of where energy storage is going. We have to go beyond just, for example, electrochemical. Uh, and also, sorry, I forgot to say chemistry as well uh, in York's cases. Um, you know, to me, sort of the question I want to start with is in both of your cases, you, you are increasing the complexity of the system, right? By adding you know, additional things from those four, list of four, uh, electrical, thermal, optical, and chemical. Um, but you have seen that there are advantages of increasing the complexity of it. Um, do you think um, this will be a challenge in scaling up because you're embracing more and more elements of energy transfer mechanisms um, compared to simpler systems, um, like batteries, for example, where it's only electrical and, uh, and chemical? Maybe I can ask your to to comment on this first. Okay, so um, 
it is true that that we're we're adding some some complexity in our case i think it's mostly the the, the chemistry right that's that's added to it um we're otherwise we're trying to keep the system as simple as possible right so so for example um particularly in the if you're only interested in the heat aspect of it um that your heat transfer fluid is air uh, there is actually no no heat exchanger because because there's direct heat exchange with with the air that's also the reactant so we're actually trying to keep it as simple as possible um and and in terms of scaling um most thermal technologies and i i think uh ours is is and, and Ashes is not not an not an exception here scale well right they get better when they get bigger and i can tell you i actually you know i showed in in, in my talk that uh the the 100 watt hour system you know we barely made five cycles uh the 10 kilowatt hour system where you actually have some significant storage and your losses are only 50 percent not you know not 95 percent anymore uh things actually get a lot easier it it you know we were able to more or less automatically cycle you know this thing has been running for 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 18 almost 2000 hours in the lab and and like i'm not you know fortunately i'm 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 past that age where i sleep in the lab so uh it's and, and and neither neither do my grad students so it's 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 actually pretty much i mean we watch it but but it runs on its own and and um so i think scaling is actually a good thing yeah i guess um my opinion about this i share i share uh Yurik's, um perspective on scaling kind of actually helps us in the sense that um it's actually kind of harder to do it when it's small because yeah. we're space constrained um, particularly inside of our vacuum chamber. Like once we have more space to move around and, and we're not so worried about uh, things touching and all these <laughs> kinds of things, it actually gets easier. Um, the other thing I would point out in terms of complexity, I think that um, my perspective about this is, is actually was heavily informed by a, a very early trip I took when I was an RPE fellow. I got a chance to go to one of Austin's um, turbine manufacturing plants. And when I got to see, I mean, you, you learn as an undergrad, you, you know, you see the picture of a turbine, you draw a little turbine on a, on a board, but until you realize how complex, I mean, it's one of some of the most complex machines on the planet. And they, and they, um, and they comprise like 90% of the entire electricity infrastructure. Like this is, this is where electricity comes from. It's super reliable and it's super complicated. <laughs> um, but that level of complexity is managed. This isn't this isn't a household product that people get to like an iPhone and people get to drop and do whatever they want with. This is a uh, heavily managed. There's a team of people that surround this thing and watch it and take care of it. And that is the that is the way the power industry works. Is they want something very reliable. And at the end of the day, if you think about it, you know, there, you think about how many heat engines exist. I mean, it's all kind of Ericsson cycles. There's a uh, um, Sterling engines and all there's all kinds of cycles but one 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 out one of them beat everything out and became the dominant technology that's used and proliferated around the entire world and that is because it meets the needs from from a performance and cost standpoint it doesn't matter that it's complex right it's actually uh, it's embraced right it's like as long as it does what we need it to do so if there was another technology that happened to be simpler, like a Stirling engine is simpler than a turbine, but it doesn't win on cost effectiveness and efficiency. And so we use the more complex technology because it works better, um, because it actually it, it meets our, our cost targets better and our efficiency better. And so in this sense, you know, I really encourage my team to really embrace the complexity. It's okay for it to be complex. As long as we understand what's happening and we understand how it works, it's all fine. Um, simplicity, I think, is nice from the standpoint that uh, it's easy for people to understand and, e and easy for people to follow when you're trying to explain it to folks. But at the end of the day, I don't know that simplicity um, really buys us anything unless it's like making it easier to, to, to manage and operate. Um, but maintenance costs don't usually drive these things. These things are driven by CapEx. So, so better to make it complex and it works and it lasts longer than to try to make the uh, the maintenance cost, which is only ten percent of the cost anyway, a little bit little bit less. Thank you, Ashley and York. Let me also maybe add my two cents. Uh, very much resonate with what you said. I think um, 
where you have complexity, but you're able to optimize the individual blocks separately, which I think is a point that both of you uh, mentioned today, is really key. Um, for example, in the material science field, we often see this all-in-one device. And I think that's where the problem comes in, because when it's all in one, then you can't really optimize it separately. Um, you know, for example, solar cell plus electrolyzer is a really good way to make hydrogen uh, from water. And you keep it separate and you can optimize it independently. But when you put it together, it gets much more difficult. It is simpler um, when you combine the two um, into, for example, a photoelectrochemical. So from, from an engineering perspective. Um, it is actually not a better approach. Um, so I think I really resonate with this. I think it's complex, but can be optimized as unit operations and achieve their maximum cost and performance trade-offs between the two. Really completely. And, 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 and maybe to add the, the in both technologies we saw today, you have a separation essentially of the power block and the energy and the storage, right? And and we can we can scale the storage. Uh, just to the size that is required in a given application, and and, and finally to 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 complexity, there there's technological complexity, but there's also psychological complexity, right? And and Asha, you said it right, like all all electricity comes from like today, right? It's all it's there's a little bit of hydropower and there's a little bit of PV, but it's it's all thermal, right? So so utilities know this this kinds of systems, right? Uh, they integrate well with what's there, right? With the infrastructure that's there. So speaking of integrations and dropping in your solutions uh, into the grid, certainly on a system level, this is a, a, a no brainer, right? This is when the technology works, uh, this will be easy to drop in. The, the one aspect I think that does stand out uh, from adopters of technology such as yours is that you're going fundamentally to a, a considerably higher temperature, especially in Ashley's case, to really derive um, the better Carnot efficiency. Um, do you expect this to be a bottleneck in terms of stability, in terms of customer adoption, um, you know, going to 2000 degrees C or 1400 degrees C, um, which is considerably beyond some of the current thermal cycles? Um, how, how have you been interacting with prospective customers in this area? Are there any psychological issues there? I know I can I can go first. Or um, so so there, 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 this is a question that that we've been asked, right? Because if you talk to a turbine, uh, a turbine guy or girl, um, they'll say, "Oh, 1500 degrees C, right?" No, we can't do that because it's 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 you know all all, all nickel alloys. Uh, they're all like 1260 ish degrees. Um, now um, we don't see this as as like for our technology specifically we don't see it as an issue because the way we we do this is we have a we have a bypass valve that and i have not shown it in the slides just not not to to make things too complex but actually there's a bypass valve where we're uh over the discharge of the system um you're uh we're bypassing a varying uh amount of air uh, to keep the turbine inlet temperature constant throughout the discharge, right? So what the turbine actually sees is pretty much the same temperature as it would see uh, in in the case of a natural gas turbine, right? So so in in our case, uh, that's something that has come up, and uh, it, re it requires a little bit of explanation and education, and and um, uh, the fifteen hundred degrees C in our case are actually necessary to have an essentially constant twelve hundred degrees C. Or, or 1100 degrees C, right? Even, even with the chemistry that you still need a little bit of, of drop to control that. And we're not as far off. So, so um, it, you know, an, an, an engineer usually gets it or pretty quickly. Ashley? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't, you know, I think people, what puts people at rest or at ease is, is two things. One, when you realize that tin's oxidation is very weak. It's not like one of these alkali metals that it'll, that'll explode, <laughs> you know, um, when it gets water on it or something like that. Uh, so it's it's a very weak oxidation. If you, you you know we we it's like solder. You can melt it in air. It'll form gradually form a little oxide crust. It's not it's not dangerous in that respect. The second fear people usually have is you get something this hot. Imagine it like spills out all over the floor, kind of thing. Um, that's actually kind of hard for it to do. 
Uh, we've had spills before in my lab. Um, the reason is because it's shrouded in a big thick layer of insulation. So as it's working its way through the insulation, the insulation temperature is decreasing and it cools and it freezes. So it actually freezes usually inside the system. Uh, it's very difficult for it to get out and actually pour out anywhere. Um, I guess this isn't necessarily put people at ease, but it's, I guess, an important reality to think about. You know, if you think about someone like being burned by it somehow, right? Um, you know, it's, it's uh, if, if someone drops 2000 degrees C metal on your foot, it's the same basic outcome as if they drop 600 degrees C salt on your foot. I mean, it's super hot. <laughs> it's going to burn you and it's the same basic outcome. So, so the, 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 uh, safety issues are not really all that different than molten salt, and there's a hundred of those plants around around the world that uh, operate pretty safely and, and are now considered essentially a proven technology. So we're able to really piggyback off of a lot of the safety infrastructure procedures and constraints associated with with molten salt technology. And actually, just to um, build on that, that in terms of um, regulatory compliance when dealing with high temperature. Um, heat and material, I presume it won't be very different from the steel making industry. Um, right. I think York mentioned blast furnaces. Um, it, it has this already come up in terms of how this could get approved as a project? Yeah, I think it's it's the same um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, but we have an extra layer of protection, which is that ours is in a warehouse with inert gas. So this isn't something someone's just going to walk up and touch, right? Like in order to even go in there, you'd need an oxygen tank. So there's there's so many layers of safety between you, us, and the actual device, uh, the actual system that um, most of these things are mitigated. But you're right. I mean, you say 2,400 degrees Celsius, and it surprises people. But then when you start to walk through the advantages, then they start to realize. I mean. I, you, you, you could right now go turn on an incandescent light bulb and you can bring your, your hand within two inches of something at 2,400 degrees Celsius, <laughs> right? I mean, people have this in their homes. Um, it's not as though these temperatures are never achieved anywhere. It's just that people are comfortable with that. Right. So actually, you know, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'd like to maybe ask one last question and, and get your thoughts on this. Um, both of you stress the importance of diversity in the modes of operation, whether it's the duration of storage um, and, and other characteristics of your battery. When you speak to your potential customers and customers, um, can you give us a sense of exactly how, what application can they enable when they have a storage that can go from days to season, right? Because that doesn't really exist readily elsewhere. And then just for our audience too, you know, this is your regular spider plot of energy storage where you want, you know, you want your um, uh, low cost, you want round trip efficiency, you want diversity of operations. It's really hard to get one technology that does it all. But uh, for more we're hearing today, Ash and York, I think you check a lot of the boxes there, especially when you can deploy it at scale. So I want to get a sense of what your customers and downstream, what can they do? Uh, with your technology that they can't do with, say, something that only checks a few of those boxes and cannot be used as diversely as yours. Uh, maybe I can ask York. Right. So um, I'm actually at the moment in conversation with uh, a range of more small and medium-sized companies uh, that require process heat. Um, a lot of them is uh, high-pressure steam. So we're talking, you know, a few hundred degrees C uh, that is currently gas-fired. And just to give you an idea, currently uh, spot market natural gas prices uh, in Europe are somewhere between 100 and 200 euro slash dollars uh, per megawatt hours, which is crazy. I don't know what's that in MMBQ, but it's 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 a factor between five five or more of what 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 prices in the U.S. are currently. Uh, electricity is actually quite a bit cheaper, quite a bit, like factors. Um, and uh, they are just worried about uh, if you have, an, uh, if you have uh, energy intense, uh, heat intense processes in, in your company, and, and we're talking to packaging, uh, food, dairy, um, 
glass, although that's a little that's a little harder. Uh, a lot of metal smeltering, like aluminum smeltering, uh, re uh, remelting of metals. Um, they, they're um, pulp and paper. Um, a lot of it is is I would say about fifty percent of the people we're current or the companies we're currently talking about uh, to is steam, high pressure steam, you know, a couple hundred degrees C steam uh, on the on the heat side. Um, and then uh, the rest of it is a little bit more diverse. Uh, a lot of um, uh, just gas heated processes that where you where you basically need a you need a stream of hot hot air slash hot combustion gases. Um, and this this varies a little more. Drying processes, for example, where you would use it just directly the flue gases. Um, so so it. It's a range, and then and then a little further down our pipeline, we're we're, we're talking to to utilities where it's basically you know it's it's gas gas turbines. So so that that's something they're very comfortable with and and very familiar with. But uh, in in terms of the product pipeline, it's just a heat application where we're where we're just the closest to to actually getting a, a product into the market. Ashley, yeah, I um I think that uh, I think it's going to take a while to to do essentially customer education um you know i think that you know when you talk about the utilities you're talking about the central backbone of the entire modern modern world um and what allows the modern world to be what it is and it is the most like one of the most risk averse industries that exists it takes them a long time to get used to an idea before it's like widely adopted and accepted so the time scale here for adoption is like 50 years takes a long time um, for a particular idea to percolate and really catch on and, and really get widely deployed. I think that one of our approaches and in, in my company that we're trying to take is to try to simplify things for the customer. I think one thing that um, like we don't we don't want them to have to go create a new storage market. Like that's that, that's like asking the customer to do do too much work. Instead, what we're trying to do is look at pairing the PV or the renewables with the battery. Because one thing that many utilities have done over the last decade or two is they have gotten in the habit or gotten used to creating a mechanism for them to put some form of renewables on their grid. And what we want to market it as is we, we will sell you renewables. They just, you get to tell us when you want it to turn on. And we handle the complexity rather than forcing them to handle the complexity. So I think that, that that's part of our approach in trying to ease the transition. Um, but I think it's going to take a while before they actually realize all the things you can actually do with this technology. It's, there's so many features to the flexibility. Um, I remember being at a meeting some years ago, and there was a guy who was a grid operator, and he was he was giving a talk, and he said, if anyone ever wants to know what it's like to be a grid operator, it's like trying to drive on the highway at 80 miles an hour, and you're blindfolded, and you only get to open your eyes every three seconds for a split second. <laughs> and that's what it's like trying to manage the grid. Like all of a sudden a car could show up out of somewhere and you have to, you know, you have to very quickly adjust and they're constantly trying to balance the load. And so now realizing that they may have a resource that could ramp at gigawatt scale, you know, you could get an extra gigawatt or two or 10 gigawatts all of a sudden in a matter of seconds, if you deploy it, you know, I don't think that's not a capability they've ever had. And so, you know, teaching them that that's a possibility is going to take a while. Thank you, Ashe. Thank you, York. Um, this is truly exciting, very unified, I think, presentations from the both of you conveying some of the same messages with uh, slightly varied versions of the thermal energy storage technologies. Um, great. Um, and best of luck to you both uh, in your uh, academic turn entrepreneurial um, ventures. Um, really excited to continue to follow both. And as um, Ashe and York mentioned, they're hiring like crazy. So I'm sure there are many students and recent graduates who are looking for positions. Please do reach out to the both of them. I'd like to thank you both again. Um, Kaylee and Evan Capenda, closing slides, please. So this is the first of our summer presentations for StorageX. We have three more uh, in two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks, talking about uh, flow batteries, aqueous energy storage, and also material informatics for accelerating energy storage R&D. So please uh, come back uh, and, and, and attend these talks uh, if your schedule permits. And as a reminder, please uh, stay connected with us. And if you're interested on 
um, learning more about uh, energy storage and other uh, energy transformation technology, Stanford also offers online education, and you can find more details on the link on the right there. Once more, York and Ashe, thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you in person soon sometime in the future.